So, comrades and friends, um, are we are we are we good now? Okay, we're good. So, it has been a hard week, uh, in the in the sense of uh, really looking at what happened in the in the in the city in regard to housing. This uh, the the mayor's housing plan is going to, in so many ways, devastate. Uh, particularly poor people, and, and, and it really, truthfully, almost is like just a, a complete shedding of poor people in the city in a way that is so despicable and so racist and, 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 and truly shows the ruling class at its, its most terrible. So, as people know, uh, there was uh, uh, the mayor's housing plan. There's around two amendments. One was mandatory inclus uh, inclusionary housing, which is called MIH. The other one is zone for quality affordability, ha, ZQA. And so, so this is the plan is supposed to put um, in supposedly 200,000 affordable housing units. 20% of so-called affordable units are going to be priced around 40% of the average medium income in rezoned neighborhoods. So that's with the understanding that an average medium income has been um, given in, in the, of looking at from all the way of Westchester County to the South Bronx, it's the understanding now that we're like we're looking at neighborhood um, 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 average medium income. So. Thirty-one thousand dollars for a family of three is supposed to so supposedly, but still, this doesn't really reach folks. When we think about a quarter of the people in the city make twenty-five thousand dollars or less a year, that currently right now people live in the city, and eighty percent of the city of people living in the city are rent burdened. That we have upwards of sixty thousand people in the shelter system a night, and honestly, something I'm you know as a, as someone who's a social worker, I listen to lots of people, particularly in Brooklyn, that are teachers, talk about in whole neighborhoods like East New York, uh, Brownsville, that high percentages, anywhere between 50 to 70 percent of the young people in that school system, in that particular school, are living in the shelter system. Lots of teachers, guidance counselors have talked about that they are working now with a population of young people that currently live in the shelter system and going to school. With this said, we need to be so clear. You see the blue pieces of paper on your, on your things? This is the moment that the Brooklyn Anti-Gentrification Network has put out, um, thank you, put out uh, a clear understanding about the fact that community boards were once a, 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 a sort of a, a, a place that communities in the 70s said, you know, we need some kind of accountability of our communities. And they, community boards function on three levels, right? One about it's about land use so liquor licenses that kind of thing the, how tall buildings go up that's one thing if you need services from a, a city agency your community board that's one of the other roles that they play um, but the thing about community boards is they're just advisory they're just advisory they have no veto power and so what happened was particularly with with MIH and ZQA was that 52 out of 59 community boards, and I want to be clear about community boards. In this moment, community boards, you know, we could talk, Comrade Ann is here, we could talk about the fact that like CB9, we have had developers, like people, workers that work for development companies on those community boards. We, I mean, community boards have now become a bastion for gentrifiers. Like it completely is, it's an appointed by the borough president is not like in any way, shape, or form. It's a who knows who kind of thing. Even if you want to do the right thing, you might not get appointed next year. We have bigots and racists purposefully in neighborhoods of color that have been placed in community boards just so they can, with the sole purpose, to inflame all kinds of racist stuff inside of, in, inside of community boards. But yet again, 52 out of 59 community boards said, this plan that the mayor has, no way, and voted it down. 52 out of 59 community boards across the, across the city. And de Blasio said, oh, well, so what? You're advisory. You have no veto power and moved on. And that's what we're seeing is the developers, that becomes, this is ground zero and why there's so many rezoning struggles. So people believe that rezoning a neighborhood is gonna save your neighborhood. Let's rezone it. Let's, let's do this, let's do this, let's do that. And I always, we will always talk about the fact that first and foremost, nobody asks for their neighborhoods to be rezoned. 
People are like, are desperate because they don't want the mayor's plan, they don't want the developer's plan, they don't want the gentrifier's plan, and so they then create this community, their own um, plans, but then again, they're just advisory. And city planning, they come in and say, city planning, will you help us? And city planning goes, oh, sure, we're gonna help you. And they look over, there was an article that came out this week about like the, the, the developer, the real estate developer, that actually helped as part, part of the architecture of the mayor's plan. He's advised by real estate developers. They're like, no, this actually we really want this over here, and we want this over there, and that's how this plan has also come in place. Let's be clear. This plan is a pro-gentrification plan. So even when people go and say, city planning, come and help us. The developers are coming for us. City, plan can, city planning ignores it and stays in favor of whatever, the, whatever, again, whatever serves capitalism, that's what they're doing, right? So with all of this said, and oh my God, my voice is might go. We're having Brooklyn Anti Gentrification Network, and I'm, I'm again wanting to be really clear too um, of, of of wearing my workers well work uh, workers world hat in this because I, mean, I want to talk a little internally about some stuff that oh I don't need this, but <laughs> people should read this. But thank you, Cher. Um, that when there is um, not the, and wanting to be really clear, it's not. That anyone, the Brooklyn Anti Gentrification Network is definitely a left pole. It is, uh, it's grassroots groups. I mean, the most sort of, uh, the, 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 the organization with the most money and sort of staffing in the Brooklyn Anti Gentrification Network is the Audre Lorde Project. If that is, you know, our neighbors upstairs, the LGBT people of color leadership, they're like, woo, they're the big giant group in the, in the, in the, in the network. It's not gonna help, but thanks for the water. Thank you so much. This is like, that's all. It's from violence. <laughs> My voice is from violence this week. So, so with this said, the understanding is that the demand is for elected community boards, and not with just the understanding like we wouldn't even be in this mess if the community boards were actually representative of our communities and had veto power. We would not be in this mess right now. Because at least then we could struggle in a way against um, the mayor and say like actually, 52 community boards have spoken, but have no power to do anything about it. Really, so then the other piece that happened is people heard that the mayor then was like, they, there was a whole moment they were like, we're gonna have community hearings. And on February 8th and 9th, with like basically nobody in tow, they said, we're gonna have these community meetings. And all these groups signed on and said, are you kidding? Nobody's ready for these meetings. We, we, we just, we, we, we don't, we're not, we don't want this. Didn't you hear we don't want this? And they went ahead, we, we signed on to it, and, and they said, we're going ahead anyway, and had these hearings. We don't know who came to those hearings, because most of the people on the ground were not at them, but again, the mayor said, oh yeah, that's right. Community, you're just advisory. Community um, organizations, we could care less what you have to say. So then, the Rafa Coalition, which is basically de Blasio's like housing folks, um, and nonprofit and the non-industrial um, nonprofit industrial complex, um, had big giant housing organizations, and they sort of postured. They came out of de Blasio's actual campaign. Like, let's be real. Like, some of these forces are part of his administration, but whatever. It's a real affordability um, affordability um, coalition. Tons of groups, groups that we know and love that are doing stuff around fighting around public housing, all kinds of different groups, smaller tenant associations. Some of these are really grassroots groups. And some of these are big, giant agency organizations that get tons of money from city contracts. Let's be real. They then said, said they postured and negotiated more um, affordable, quote, quote unquote, affordable housing, because again, the way that the mayor's plan originally was that it was $51,000 to $80,000 qualified as low income. Yes, yes, eyes. Eyes bulge out of your head at this moment. If you made $51,000, you are now low income. I smile and laugh because this is real, that you could get some housing um, and the understanding. And we've been saying 40% of the housing, right? And we've been saying, and, and again, one of the things that most of the housing movement has been saying, or people, or people in the community is like, why is, the, if we as working class people, as, as low income people, as poor people, as middle class people, are the majority of the people in this city? Why are we even getting a small percentage of housing? How much luxury housing can be built in a city? Why must the rich have the majority? Why are we still, thank you so much, why are we still 
only getting so much housing. So then Rafa Coalition, again, went and said, we are actually for the mayor's plan. We've gotten this little, some, some consen um, concessions from him, and now we're in a victory. So what happened was, then there was a, a, a movement, um, more from the left and more like uh, working class forces who said, enough and had demonstration at City Hall on Tuesday. Very well attended, very awesome, still very, like, from a very grassroots community level, still nonprofit industrial complex, you know, in its, in its sort of nature, but was a, called out the mayor and said, this is a pro-gentrification plan. And even no matter what you say or do, the bottom line is, let me just read you this quick statistic. This plan that as it stands right now still leaves out single parent households, seniors, people making minimum wage, over 207,000 families on the NYCHA wait list, which NYCHA is public housing, healthcare aides, childcare workers, bus drivers, taxi drivers, security guards. Think about all the various jobs and folks that do not make and qualify for the, the even $35,000 a year is not what people are making, right? And then, you know, again, with the understanding that average medium income in Brooklyn alone or in the South Bronx are still like 34, 32, and as I said before, that still like a quarter of the people that live in the city make $25,000 and under. The plan does not even account for them in any way, shape, or form as it stands and signed. And only five city council people voted and, and voted against this plan. Only five. Uh, we know that Jumani Williams voted no. We know that Inez Barron voted no, made a very eloquent speech. We know, um, I want to I wanna say, I don't know the other three because I was busy getting arrested. Okay, I'm not ready, almost arrested. So, we, but so, so, in, so with that understanding, folks then also decided to do civil disobedience. And I think we can sort of say it publicly now. Um, I'm very proud that a lot of the forces that were involved in that civil disobedience and that disruption were picture of the homeless. That, that, that the housing organization that is clearly in the forefront and leadership nationally and in the city talking about buying for people living in the shelter system, people formerly in the shelter system, the poorest folks in the city, they were the ones on the front lines putting their bodies on the front lines that disrupted, were thrown out of the city chamber to say, this is ridiculous, this plan cannot go forward, and very proud. And again, people saw the picture that with me was really about that the only black Muslim um, activists in that civil disobedience that people saw were getting his head, they had his hand on his head, they're trying to pull him underneath the railing in city council, and for that reason, I protested and was thrown out and choked and all that other stuff. Okay. But I'm fine. I think that's important. All right. Last but not least, because I only have seconds, and I think this is. I think what what's really important to talk about is that I, I'll just share on this level. You know what this also does. You know, people are saying like what still gives people negotiate the like people on the on the ground negotiation about what plan they will take around rezoning and all that. The truth of the matter, it's giving the green light for continuous like tenant harassment and foreclosures. That's the reality of it. What's really gonna happen, so for instance, and, 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 and why we have to remain at least at this moment hopeful. Because if people think that it's gonna be about the electeds, it's not. If people think, I mean, it's, it's all, it's, like, it's again, it's like capitalism is being like exposed. De Blasio was a progressive, right? Well, let's be clear. That's what people thought when they elected him, that he marched with the unions. His platforms that he was going to stop, stop, and frisk. And look at what happens. Ken Thomas, you know, with a Kai Gurley this week, that the DA prosecutes Peter Lang for the murder of a Kai Gurley and then comes back and says, you know, actually, we don't need jail time. He's not a problem. So what was the point of it? He, this is actually like, so all your work to prosecute him was just a show. And now... And, and now we're not going to prosecute him. And so people are, again, I, good to say that people had emergency demonstration and we have to be out there on the 14th to say, demand, we, you know, again, that we say jail killer cops. It's not that we're, you know, it, it's, it's, this is a moment that, that, if, that, that they cannot continue to say that the police are above the law. But again, what is it tied to housing? Because a Kai Gurley was killed in the pink houses during vertical sweeps. The police are, are uh, occupying forces in our neighborhood. That just a couple of hours ago in my neighborhood, a woman playing chess 
was kicked and beaten by the cops just this afternoon in Flatbush. And again, they were like, you meet the description of someone, people in the neighborhood, well, the person that you, the description of is a man, this is a, a masculine person, I don't know their identity, if they identify as trans or lesbian, but they were a masculine person. And the police decided to harass this person and take them to jail, because again, in our neighborhoods, particularly in Brooklyn and working class neighborhoods across the city, the police are an occupying force that are, go work hand in hand in gentrification. And this is what we, what, and so what, what is hopeful in this moment, that there is more of an understanding, yes, I'm about to get another note, an understanding that it is really going to take people power. That we cannot count and, and, and in any way, shape, or form, I mean, we as, as revolutionaries understand that. But that the average worker now sees like, yes, your city council. They called them, they dogged them, they picketed in front of them, and still they sold out people. Five out of, what is it, how many city council people? Is it 71? 51. 51. Five out of the 51. I mean, like, complete sellout of the people and, and the ramification of that that we need to continue to be in the streets around housing, continue to be in the struggle to fight gentrification, but be really clear that it's going to take people power and not looking to some elected, not looking to some huge nonprofit. It's going to take like forces from picture the homeless. It's going to take our grandmothers. It's going to take, you know, our, our young people to be in the streets to stop what is the devastation of a whole generation of people being able to live in New York City or anywhere in the country if you don't make what? $51,000 a year, 51 to $80,000 a year to have affordable housing in New York City. Thank you, comrades. We can talk a little bit about uh, cues. I mean, the struggle there, and I don't know if people get a chance to see online what, like, not only the civil disobedience, uh, the press conference, like the reading of the statement was powerful. Actually, comrade, I mean, this struggle of the you, our, our comrades have been in the f not only just in the forefront of it, but really, truthfully, um, have like put their bodies on the line, both the civil disobedience, and and I think you know, in particularly that we're also talking about that those are all. Uh, queer or trans identified comrades of color that are there in the branch all under the age of uh, probably like 26 um, that are in the forefront of this struggle there, right? And in the forefront of the struggle just in general nationally and what this, this is, I, I, Q is incredibly modest, they were incredibly modest about the fact that when this bill happened, um, I'm trying to even remember some of the, like I think American Airlines put out a statement. Like, like this, like this, this is like, this bill impacts business. And it's like the capitalists are like, whoa. In 2016, like American Airlines was like, we're supposed to be talking about inclusion. Obama passed a gay marriage, you know, like a bill. Like this is like sending this back into like like into like decades of repression. And it's it's it really is important that even the ruling even within the ruling class are like what are you saying that we're supposed to deny service to LGBTQ people and particularly gender nonconforming people? You're saying it's now the law in, in North Carolina that we get to do that. And folks are like, are you kidding? Are you kid are you serious? So that our comrades are in the forefront of this struggle, um, is a, a very not only just significant, but again that they're, you know young, working class, queer and trans people of color that are taking the lead um, and is seen as the lead. The, the, the piece around what Jim asks about, you know, I think this is a, such an interesting thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm be a communist in this moment, but also I guess I, I, I also do this for a living. I do what is, you know, seen as cultural competency or whatever, but like basically let's talk about like, how do we, how do we look at, um, you know, people's identities and in and, and a non-oppressive kind of way to really look at it from like, you know, truthfully a revolutionary political kind of way. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is that I, we're fighting for people to do whatever the hell they please.
So it's not so much about one day will we all be there or whatever. I, it's such an interesting thing. What I think is awesome is right now that people that, that you know, cisgender people, non-trans people, even talk about the understanding of having a gender identity. And that's the reality. Every one of you in this room right now, can I do what I, my little stupid exercise that I do in my training? Look for a moment at the way you're sitting. Look at how you're sitting. Is your legs crossed? Are your legs open? That Look at how you sit in your body right now. All of it. Are you wearing pants? Are you wearing a dress? What are you doing? That is all part of your gender expression, that your legs are crossed, that your legs are open, all of that. And think about, like, what would you be wearing if it was the first day of a, at, at, at a new job? What do you, what, what we say is, what is your power drag? What are your clothes on your body? What is your power drag? Did you feel powerful? What did you wear to the job interview to get that job? Think about what you wore if you were like, you feel it's Friday night and you're feeling a little like, I'm going to go out and you want to attract the attention of someone that you desire. What would you wear? All of that is about your, how, how you act, what you wear. Was, there was no meeting. <laughs> but with that, with that and, I, and I, I like to say, what would you wear now that you've, you've attracted the attention of that person that you really like and now you're dating them, what is, how, does your, how, does, how do you change what you wear? Maybe, maybe that changes. And we can talk about what you look like when you were nine compared to what you look like when you were 50 or anywhere in between or older or younger, depending on who we are. With all of that said, that's all about gender identity and expression. The truth of the matter is that, that, that trans and gender nonconforming people actually face oppression based on that. And that's the difference. So that we've coined the understanding in the movement now that people say things like, what is your gender, preferred gender pronoun? That people start meetings. That even in, in business worlds right now, that people say, my pronoun is she, my pr pronoun is they, call me or my name, right? And at the same time, I love to say, you know, and you know, I can out myself as a trans-identified person, is the understanding that I've done that exercise in a room full of trans women who then get angry and want to kill people. Because as far as they're concerned, they have spent thousands of dollars to look the way that they look and breathe the way that they live, and they don't have to. So they're almost like, well, what do I look like? Mm -hmm. Is this not clearly feminine in front of you? And clearly my pronoun is she. And how dare you ask me anything about m identifying myself? And that, and so wanting to be really clear about that people that were fighting for self-determination of people being able to identify in any way they shape or want to, if they decide that they have, that their, that their gender pronoun is nickel, then it's nickel. If they decide that my gender pronoun and that my gender expression is as binary as possible, because that is freeing to my being, then we're fighting for that too. So whatever that is. Does it make sense? Yes. All right. Thank you. So, so, with, so, so with that said, what was the other thing? We're back on uh, Joe. Was it Joe? Did, Joe, did you leave? Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I, I could go on and on, and I want to be disciplined. I want to be a disciplined person in regard to the nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> I really do, because I want to be clear, and especially like I, I want to be really clear about it, because we can call, talk about social dem democracy all we want to, and the reality of it is, unfortunately, a lot of the organizations, picture the homeless as a nonprofit. Audre Lorde Project, this entire building is full of radical nonprofit organizations, and that's the reality, that a lot of black and brown, Black Lives Matter at this moment in time gets, gets grant funding or some looks for donations. The convening that we talked to about that happened last year was funded. And we could talk about it, and so I want to say that out loud because that's the reality. For people to be able to do stuff, we, people had to get money. For all the grass, Domestic Workers United to pass a bill, they got funding. Yeah. And that's the reality. But at the same time, that does not mean liberation. And we got to be clear about that. So again, in the Rafa Coalition, there are big, giant nonprofits like Acorn, which is now in New York and NYCC, that negotiated a deal. Rafa got funding. I know for a fact that they got funding from New York Foundation for fifty thousand dollars, and they had a staff. I know that Casa and other groups did like they are funded groups. 
And they did their own little back room deal with like a whole bunch of other groups that are like not, well, not in those discussion. And they declared victory. And so there's all these other people in the coalition that were like, what? When did that meeting happen? We weren't at that meeting. And they don't see victory. They don't. I appreciate what Comrade said because that's the reality. In my neighborhood, people are home health attendants who live and are partnered with a retail worker who then have a child that's going to college in the CUNY and we're fighting the struggle to keep CUNY. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah. And then, and maybe we're still sending money back home to take care of our family back home. How do you live when now, at this point in time, in Brooklyn, it's understood that black people cannot live, people of color, immigrants, migrant folks, we cannot live, and we have, we have the police, and we have, and we have ICE. We have raids going on in Flatbush right now of Haitian families. And so, so with all of this said, I want to actually want to, what, did, did I answer your question? Um, I, the thing that I did want to talk about is some, some hopefulness. That's all I want to just leave with some hopefulness. Because it is feel really bleak and demoralizing. And it's ang and frustrating and angering. It really is. It is a complete and utter, um, you know, and as, as Comrade mentioned, this is global. I mean, we get, I, I can tell and talk about there are people in the Hamptons that are long time, like, working class, middle class families who literally have set up tents, tents, because their landlord says, no, 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 this is, this is not about seasonal living there anymore. We're trying to personally kick you out. We, get, we have some people that make more money than you that you can use your house. And people have been displaced and living in tents in the Hamptons because they're regular, they, they're, they're regular people. They maybe work for rich people. Maybe they just rent their house. And that's the kind of stuff we're seeing. We're seeing more encampment of homeless people across the country at this point in time, people living outside. If you walk, right, if you go to 15th between 6th and 5th, I believe, you will see when you leave tonight an encampment of homeless folks, let alone the folks, and literally, I'm, I'm not using this in a derogatory term, picture of the homeless has told me about that, people are being, referring to themselves as mole people, the people that are living in the subway. They're living underground in encampments, not just sleeping. And again, the, we have Bratton saying, you can't sleep on the subway no more. We'll arrest you for sleeping on the subway. So I want to talk about hope and then and wrap up and, and Deirdre, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in our project and, I, and, uh, and just in this sense. We, we look at, you know, our group, Equality for Flatbush, but our campaign before it's got to take it back, is completely about direct action, and we believe in that. We, the city could say anything it wants to the people. You could call through and want all you want to. We don't really believe in that. We believe that people in California should call 311 for people in the middle of Brooklyn. And we put that out on social media. So we will go. We went to a, an elder's house in the middle of Brighton Beach. You could see up into the ceiling. Uh, there was a hole so big that you could see the bathtub upstairs. It was, it, that been there two years. Two years, no, no stove with gas. That's another thing they're doing. They turn off your gas for a year and a half. That's a big thing. I, we, there are comrades that have been displaced from Harlem to Brooklyn. They're now in Flatbush right now because they had no gas for over a year. Did the landlords turn off gas on people? All that kind of stuff is happening. We went on Saturday. By Sunday, the super called. By Monday, there were contractors at that house. And his apartment got fixed. And we're going back. There are other folks. We, we, have, we had like literature in Russian. And we're flyering in Russian. And it was the Sabbath. It was a little hard. But we're going to go back on a non-Sabbath day. So make sure that, because people who, there are condos going up in the middle of Brighton Beach. We need to support the people of Brighton Beach. And, and in the same way, really truthfully being like Claire, we have a bunch of folks in Crown Heights that are fighting for a ramp. We're like, it's not enough just to sort of have, we did a petition in their building, all that kind of stuff. No, 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 we're going to put this on social media. You all can sign up and support them in fighting to get a ramp. It's with all the other repairs that they're fighting for, we're getting lawyers for them to do it. But we're like, no, why is this a, like an internal thing for just the tenants fighting by themselves in isolation? We're like, this is a mass movement. And fight with everyone fighting together that it's people power that we're trying to build and that our thing. Our, our policy is between 24 to 48 hours. You don't have heat, and 24 hours you must have heat. That means everyone calls. So I wanted to share this with you, comrades, because I feel like this is, I mean, like, 
really truthfully in the most Marxist in the most revolutionary way we need to think about this housing struggle as our struggle not just individually for ourselves but how do we like build a mass based movement to understand that it is us against them and we have every right to use everything in our arsenal to fight to make sure to keep people in their homes and fight to make sure that we can do whatever we can to turn around this attempt to destroy the linguistic, racial, social, gender, cultural diversity of our cities. That we as poor and working class people need to just move out. I don't know, they want us to go to Mars or something like that. And we're like, no, 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 we're not giving up Brooklyn without a fight. We're not giving up Manhattan without a fight. We're not giving up Harlem without a fight. We're not giving up this fucking country without a fight. This is our, this is ours. And when we say build a workers where we really mean it, that this is ours to fight back and then, and really, really inspire people to know, yes, let's do it. Let's, let's take this back from the ruling class.